Um, yeah, so I think we'll start. Yeah, sorry for the delay. Um, slight technical issues, but we're really happy to see everyone here. Yes. Yeah, very excited to, to be here. Um, so uh, if you're all ready, we'll get started. Um, so uh, we wanted to welcome you all to the Truth in Journalism Conference, um, we'll be, where we'll be talking about how journalists think about accuracy um, over the next couple of days. Uh, to introduce ourselves, uh, I'm Alison Baker. This is Vivian Fairbank. She's next to me. Um, we both use she, her pronouns. And for anyone who can't see us, um, I am, we are both white women uh, in our late 20s. I have blonde hair. I'm wearing a black turtleneck uh, and black pants. Vivian is also wearing a black turtleneck. We like to match. We do like to match. <laughs> and a black skirt. Um, we are in the Resource Center at uh, Carleton's School of Journalism and Communication. Kind of looks like a library. There are some antique antiques, I believe. They look antique. <laughs> and other decor. Um, and yes, we're just really excited to have you all here. Uh, there's about, I'd say maybe 20-ish people in front of me in person, and obviously other people online. Just saw myself on the screen, not going to look to my right. <laughs> um, yeah, so Vivian and I um, just sort of wanted to take this time to sort of introduce ourselves, set the tone for the conference, and then we'll We'll hand it over to Nagan Sinclair for the incredible keynote he will give tonight. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, so we are, Vivian and I, are the organizers of this conference, of course, and also the creators of the TIJ project, which we will talk a bit more about, or a lot more about tomorrow. Um, but as I said, we wanted to set the tone for tonight, uh, both in the present moment and also in a, situate ourselves in, in a larger journalistic and historical context, um, and give you an overview of also what you can expect over the next couple of days. Um, so as part of our research over the past year and a half, which is wild that it's been that long. Um, we had the great privilege of speaking to incredible, incredible people, uh, both inside and outside of journalism, and to work with them and collaborate with them. Um, and uh, to talk about the, the context in which, sorry, my screen is so tiny, I have really bad eyesight, so <laughs> we're going to go with this. Um, so, uh, and to talk about journalism ethics, uh, ethical research practices, and um, how journalists work in North America. And these conversations not only informed our work, but they also informed this conference. And uh, we think of journalism not as an individual endeavor, but really as a collaboration uh, between sources, between reporter, between uh, the publication and also between the public itself. And so we really encourage everyone here, student, journalist, non-media industry person, <laughs> uh, online and in person, to speak with one another, to ask questions, and also obviously to ask, ask questions if you want and come say hi. Um, um, yeah, we're just going to be hanging around and listening for most of this conference, which we're excited about. Um, but we wanted to tell you a bit about um, how we are thinking about the conference and how we hope that you might think about it as well. Um, so Ali and I have known each other for almost a decade. Um, we met in residence in first year university in journalism school um, at Toronto Metropolitan University. And um, I say Toronto Metropolitan um, in a way that already touches kind of on the problematic history of this country, um, because at the time it was called Ryerson University. And it was named after Egerton Ryerson, who was one of the first proponents of residential schools for indigenous children um, and played a role in the genocide of indigenous peoples uh, in this country. And the name of the school was recently changed to TMU. And um, that conversation about name change kind of started when we were studying there. Um, and the year before our graduation was the year of the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And just as we were kind of entering the magazine industry after that, um, we were also thinking about how journalists could and often were perpetuating injustice, harm, and violence, again, commu against communities. Um, both by deciding not to report on them and by reporting on them in problematic ways. Um, and that affected kind of every aspect of our lives, or it does affect every aspect of our lives, um, including the places where we are and our interactions with people. So for example, um, we are currently on campus at Carleton University, which is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. Um, and we encourage everyone online to think about where they are right now and what the history of that land is and what their responsibilities might be to the people of that land. Um, in our case here, Algonquin territory has never been dealt with by a land sharing treaty. 
and Algonquin title to the land continues to exist. Um, that means everyone here has a responsibility uh, to the Algonquin people and to adhere to their cultural protocols. Um, and we've long known about that responsibility, and we often hear about it during like, land acknowledgements at conferences. Um, but it's not always clear kind of what to do with that knowledge afterwards, um, and especially as members of the journalism industry. Yeah, and so the more uh, established we've both sort of become in the industry, um, the more we've been able to interact with people who have really been doing a lot of work to address these problems and talk about them. Um, but also at the same time, we've been privy to conversations within media about these issues that felt very, at the very least, inadequate. Um, and that also really seemed to misunderstand what we saw to be the root of the problem, um, that it's not only the, the issues about individual journalistic practice or about the final product of a journalism work, like the journalistic work, uh, it's about journalism as a whole and how journalists think about uh, their own work um, and practice. So we want this conference to sort of invite people to think about the practice of journalism, uh, Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm good. Okay, thank you. Uh, we want this conference to invite people to think about the practice of journalism, the notions of accuracy and verification, and whether the defini definitions of those things, um, and also the definitions of uh, reporting the truth, uh, only the facts, and verification um, are uh, the right. Uh, definitions um, that we're operating under. So we believe that the answer to these questions uh, gives us an opportunity uh, to understand how different ethical issues uh, in journalism are actually interconnected and it also allows us to engage with all people and all communities who are uh, often harmed by mainstream media practices. Yeah, so in our mind, these ideas are operating in the background of kind of every talk and panel um, at this conference, even when they're not explicitly being talked about. Um, and we invite you to think about them as well over the next few days, um, starting with the keynote tonight. Um, just to give you an overview of what's to come. So uh, tomorrow, there will be um, the launch of the fact-checking guide we've been working on in the morning. That way we get it out of the way. Um, and then there'll be um, a keynote by Tom Rosenstiel about uh, the journalism industry today, um, how journalists think about their work and what the future of journalism looks like. Um, and then we'll spend the rest of the day having panels um, with journalists and also with researchers from other fields and with members of different communities talking about all the ways um, that um, journalism exists today. We start with kind of an overview of what journalism looks like, then we have lunch, uh, then we talk about all the ways that journalism has sometimes gone wrong, then we eat more coffee, more food. We, we eat coffee. We, we eat, eat coffee. coffee. Um, and then That's we're going to end the day by hopefully talking about solutions and, and ways that actually people have been doing really cool work um, to address these issues. Um, and then on Friday, um, we have an objectivity themed day. Um, and we're going to end with a closing keynote from Percent on uh, objectivity in journalism. Uh, the schedule is online. Um, and if uh, Basically, all information is online if you need it. We're always here for all the in-person attendance if you need anything. Um, we also have some wonderful research assistants who will be hanging around um, and can answer any questions. Um, for people who are here, um, bathrooms are just across the hall. Um, and tomorrow, we're going to be meeting again in a room that's just across the hall as well. Um, so it'll be easy to find. Um, we will be wearing masks when we're sitting in the audience, um, but taking them off when we're speaking. Um, it's optional, but um, you're invited to do the same if you'd like. Um, yeah, yeah, and I guess that's sort of it for us. We'll hand it over to Nagan. We just want to say thank you to everyone um, uh, that has helped us along the way. Help, thank you to Carlton, uh, to the Walrus, to uh, the Missionary Foundation, and also the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Center Council, Council, <laughs> Council of Canada. Yeah. Uh, I know, I know. It. We call it Shirk. Sure. But this is why this is why I'm tripping up. Uh, who actually funded uh, our research and allowed it to happen? Um, also, thank you to all the attendants here, to our research assistants again. Uh, over the course of this project, we couldn't have done it without you all, um, and everybody again who has supported us along the way and dealt dealt with us yeah. over the past year and a half. Um, um, we're perfectly on time, yes. um, so we're gonna leave the stage to Nagan Sinclair um, with a little introduction video. It's no secret that newsrooms everywhere have been struggling. The business model generally that has, has worked for a long time is, is broke. So we could insert another page at 3 in the morning. So it's actually better than what's lying in your doorstep. The Facebook Accelerator really provided us with insights that are really critical 
to our future. We have tried to maintain the resources that we believe we need. And having someone like Nagan to do something that no one else is doing is highly valuable. We are a part of Kanata. Kanata is an Iroquoian, an indigenous word which means the village. I think what I've done with the paper is I brought a perspective that was not there before. We became a paper with a very strong indigenous voice. There's a social welfare crisis, a meth crisis, poverty crisis. Some indigenous peoples are sleeping in tents in deadly weather. Whereabouts are they doing them? In the tent cities. Because he is so connected to that community, he's able to tell stories that my newsroom otherwise wouldn't be able to tell. And he tells it in a way that has impact. And do you know where Smiley is? He's the one that's usually in a teepee. I haven't seen him in a while. It's about minus 40 at the wind chill right now. So it's definitely dangerous to be outside. What they're doing right now is they're checking to see if everyone is awake. We have some sandwich and granola bars. He's also strengthening other people's voices. And I think it's incredible that the free press has brought him on to do that particularly as a local paper. This is the Winnipeg that many people have either forgotten or neglected. And so it's remarkable to me that you have a small group of people who are literally saving lives. You have socks? He finds importance and he finds relevance for us as Indigenous people. Nagan Sinclair is an asset to this newsroom and we have to leverage that to get more digital readers because we recognize that we need to get more people paying online to read what we produce. Every single time we bring another Indigenous voice within the newspaper, within the media here in Manitoba and Winnipeg, we come a little bit closer to reflecting what Winnipeg and Manitoba actually looks like. And it's not simply about telling a story, it's about changing the ways that we live. How's everybody doing out there? Good. Out in YouTube land, how are you all doing out there? Great. Uh, it is a bit weird to be in this. I was just t telling uh, people here that it's a little weird to do these uh, hybrid talks, but bonjour de mes Hello, my relatives. Bonjour. It's nice to be here. It's nice to share with you a little bit about my work. And uh, I'm very privileged to work at what I think to be, I'm a little biased, uh, but what I think is the most progressive uh, newspaper in the country. Uh, I'm very privileged to be able to work with uh, the wonderful, capable Paul Simin, who spent a great deal of time in this territory as parliamentary reporter and is now uh, not, just a, uh, not just a colleague of mine, but he is very much a mentor, a friend. And uh, I have tremendous respect for Paul. Uh, I never planned to be a journalist, like, at all. That was, like, not my thing. Uh, but I, I've been an activist for a long time. I've been a community organizer, and we're going to look a little bit about what community organizing looks like, a little bit about uh, what I think to be the facade of objectivity uh, in terms of what we're talking about and what it is that we're uh, talking about when we think about truth. But I was out there organizing marches, uh, writing press releases, trying to get attention for uh, what at that time, the issue of that day, was the murder of Tina Fontaine. And then, of course, the murder of Colton Bushy, which happened concurrently as well with the, with the trials that happened at the same time. And so it was all fired up. And, uh, and so I started writing pieces, mostly very long Facebook posts, <laughs> uh, which then got the attention of Paul at the Free Press, who then invited me to, uh, to contribute to the newspaper. And uh, I discovered that uh, the most essential thing in news writing is not, are you smart? I think that's pretty a bold statement right there. Uh, not that you're the smartest. Not that you're the most capable or artistic writer. Or It is, can you meet a deadline? And I discovered that I could meet deadlines. And so Paul really liked that. And very soon after me writing a couple pieces where he kind of tested to see if he could, if I would meet my deadline uh, and my word count, uh, that one's been a little bit harder. Uh, is uh, and I'm now four years in, and uh, uh, it helped to get the the national newspaper award for columnist. Uh, I was uh, I was very helpful uh, because I think one of the things that happened, and I said this during my speech, uh, is the paper got a lot of criticism by hiring me, a lot of criticism. Uh, 
the number one criticism uh, was the papers becoming an indigenous newspaper. You don't become an indigenous newspaper because, or actually the word was from the letter, uh, I'm going to cancel my subscription. That's, by the way, the number one thing people like to threaten with newspapers. I'm going to cancel my subscription. And on the 17th time they threaten it, you realize they're not going to cancel their subscription. But um, the, uh, the, 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 I'm going to cancel my subscription because you're an Indian newspaper now. That was what Paul Simin got the first, the second day I was on the job. Because my very first column was, uh, I came out, uh, Paul said, write a little piece about yourself, introduce yourself to the Winnipeg audience. Tell them about who you are, tell them where you've come from, tell them about your family. So I did. I wrote 800 words saying, here's where I come from, I'm a former school teacher, I've done XYZ in the activist community, I've traveled around, um, here's my family, here's my ancestry, uh, and then I'm really looking forward to writing for you uh, as one of your new columnists. Uh, the hate mail that, that came in the next day was, Negon Sinclair is really arrogant because all he ever does is talk about himself. <laughs> so, <laughs> what have we learned from day one at the Winnipeg Free Press? Is that you hire one indigenous voice and you become an Indian newspaper. And that many readers, and we happen to have an older clientele at the Winnipeg Free Press, but I think just generally in media, that an indigenous voice is not going to be welcomed easily. And so I think I've, I've come along with many other Indigenous voices who have said some very similar things. But I'm very lucky to say that, you know, now we are in our fourth year and uh, I'm very invested in this relationship with the Winnipeg Free Press. I've gotten lots of different opportunities to write elsewhere, which I've stepped into in various different means. But I'm very loyal to the work that the Winnipeg Free Press is doing. I'm very proud to say that on every day there is a story about Indigenous peoples on the cover of the Free Press. That's not planned, that's not policy, but that's what a competent newsroom does when a population is 20% Indigenous in a province. 20% of every front page should be about Indigenous peoples. And it's not just about negativity, the homicide crisis which is hitting the city at the moment. It's not just about poverty but it's also about the opportunity that Manitoba provides for the rest of the country. Um, we're talking a little bit about truth, and maybe we can jump up to the slides a little bit here. Um, if we were to say, like, what is it that we're doing here? What is it that we're trying to do in media? Um, as I tell my students, uh, I taught them today, in fact, and we had a, an incredible uh, friend of mine, colleague from the Winnipeg Free Press, also writes for the Walrus and the Narwhal, uh, Julia Simone Rutgers. If you know Julia Simone, outstanding writer, but then also brilliant in the ways in which she's able to bring stories to the forefront uh, that show the humanity in uh, street life, the humanity in uh, the most direst of situations, the humanity in even those we often sometimes think of uh, in one-dimensional ways, and so, or been conditioned to think of. Uh, and so, today I said to my students, if you really want to know how to write properly, don't look to other academics look to journalists, because it's journalists who know how to persuade, journalists that know how to give flair and give interest, and it's journalists who know really how to construct an argument. This is, for God's sakes, not academics. <laughs> academics are the worst people to make arguments because their writing is so obtuse and impossible to understand, uh, and I am an academic. <laughs> so, uh, it, it's been my work in media, however, that's really taught me about the value of truth. And that's my first thought of what we're going to talk about for today. Uh, the truth is only the truth, or deemed to be the truth, if we determine it to be the truth. That means the truth is at all times constructed. It is always about perspective, and it is inherently about the ways in which we've determined what we value and what we don't. And so therefore, the truth is always going to be subjective. Now, in a postmodern world, my little academic side of me is screaming and going, but what about things happen and there just is truth? So there are these little things where we decide to call facts, but even facts um, at times have context. And that's really what I want to talk about when I talk about truth from an indigenous perspective. Our word for truth is Debway. 
or the way that you speak truth is deb away win. So oftentimes if you see a win at the end, it means it's an action word. It turns a, a noun into a verb or um, an adjective into a verb. Deb away win. But uh, to break that word down very briefly, it basically has the key part in the front, which is ode. Uh, you'll see that word ode in many of our language, uh, dodem, for example, our, our clan identities. Um, you'd also see it in odena, which is the word that we use for describing the centerpiece of a community, or ishkode, which is the word we use for fire. So what does ode mean? The word ode means heart. And so you can see within the concept of truth itself, our word means that which comes from the heart. Okay, so let's think about that for just a minute. What does it mean to have things that come from the heart? When something comes from the heart, it comes from a place of life. It comes from a place of movement, and it also comes from a place of what tends to be often warmth. But uh, it also comes from a place at the center. It is relational in its core. That's why we often use the, the term odena, which means the center or a village, right? Uh, it means the center of that village. Uh, ishkade, uh, which is the word we use for fire, which is often the center of a community. So that's where ode comes from. Ode is about the center. And it comes from that place of relationality. All right, so for indigeneity, for indigenous peoples, Anishinaabe peoples, my peoples, it, to tell the truth means to tell something that comes from your heart. Now, how does that influence us? I want you to use your heart to do a bit of journalism here. Yeah, I didn't think this would be participatory, did you? Right? I can't turn off my, uh, my classroom uh, life. I was a former high school teacher, by the way. It was my first gig. And uh, uh, then I went on to become a couple other things. But the thing that I, I am most proudest of is in 2011, 2012, uh, a movement emerged called Idle No More. And I had always been involved in politics my whole life. I grew up at the time of Oka. I grew up in the time of uh, Ipawash. I grew up in the time of Charlottetown, Meech Lake. Uh, it's amazing how many people don't remember that time in this generation, don't know about all the Charlottetown, Me Meach Lake stuff. But I grew up in a time in which also my father uh, had Phil Fontaine, uh, Elijah Harper. My dad was actually Elijah Harper's first campaign manager. Uh, I had um, Ovid McCurdy. Like they were literally sitting around the kitchen table talking about politics. Uh, and then in the background, my mothers and my aunties all telling, really the ones running the show. They're the ones who really told everybody what to do. That's the thing that the books don't often talk about. But during that time uh, of I Don't Know More and during activism and during the time period, which I think to be the most important social action movement in Canadian history, this side of the civil rights movement, uh, this happened. Uh, there was a little community, a Mi'kmaq community called Elsie Buktuk, which uh, is not often spoken about anymore, but at the time uh, was facing the issue of uh, fracking on their community for natural gas. And this uh, exploration was not wanted by the community. Uh, this was rejected by all forces within the community, except for a few in leadership who then agreed with the New Brunswick government to allow exploration, which would be devastating to the local ecology, devastating to our animal relations, devastating to the water. And so community activists uh, came together and stood on their own territories and refused to allow uh, the exploration trucks to come through. The New Brunswick Company, uh, sorry, the New Brunswick Company, that's not really a mistake there. Uh, the New Brunswick government uh, decided to employ uh, their national resources to call in the RCMP. And uh, on the day that the expiration was to happen, this event happened. Now, just to give you a little bit of a warning on this, uh, there's a language warning. It is also triggering images, so I'm, I apologize. Um, so if you are triggered in some way, please take good care of yourself. Uh, there's nothing to terrible in this, but you will hear some swear words and also um, some instances that are leading towards violent but are, are not quite at that stage. There's a little bit of it, right? a, little, a little bit of a fist thrown here and there. Um, this image, though, is available. Uh, you can catch it on YouTube if you want to watch the entirety of it. I'm only going to show about a minute and a half of it, two minutes of it, but I'm going to show you three segments. 
The first segment is going to show you about the reaction of LC Book took to what I think to be not just police, but institutions like journalists. And I want you to think about that because I'm going to assign all of you a story is to cover this. I'm giving you, we're in the newsroom, I'm going to say your job is to cover this. You go out to the community and you witness this. All right, this is, uh, um, yeah. Okay, so you've researched everything, you know what's happening, you know LC Book took is not interested in having exploration on their territory, and uh, this is what happened when the police show up. They got trained! Yeah. <laughs> First minute, first segment down. This is the only thing that was seen, that part right there was really the only part that was seen on national media, is the part around the conflict, because uh, we as journalists are actually rep are rewarded for showing the most conflict. The, rewarded in such a way that we are uh, held up in esteem as being able to carry or tell the story in some way in the shortest amount of time. If you do a news pack, uh, those of you who are not media people, that's the little segments on the two minutes or so reporters get on news shows. Uh, you have to tell the story as quickly as possible. Now, in the newspaper, you get a little bit more space, but 800 words is not all that much. Uh, magazines, 2,500, right? But the bottom line of it is, is that what can you do in the fastest amount of time? So what you can show here is you can show conflict. Um, with the story that you might also note that there's a very acrimonious relationship with institutions, but particularly police. What I say to journalists is that because of all the work that's happened up to this point, because of the misrepresentation, because of the violence, because of the ways in which journalists have failed to tell the story of Indigenous perspectives, this is pretty much the way journalists are viewed on communities. They are seen as invaders, they are seen as colonizers, and it's not your fault, but it is your inheritance that if you get assigned any Indigenous story, uh, a community will not trust you. They will not trust you. Oh, and by the way, they don't trust me either. Because as soon as I carry that little Winnipeg Free Press badge on my neck, uh, it is the same. It, it, I may look a little bit different. I might get an extra five seconds, but it is the same to start. It is the institution that has carried a great deal of weight. Now, I want to show you the second segment to this video, which I think gets us much closer to the truth than the first segment, which is the one that defined the truth about this story. Here's the second segment, which I think is the most powerful moment uh, I've ever seen, <coughs> I've ever seen as a, uh, as a person who covered this story, as a person who, who talked about this. And I was also at the same time very uh, invested because I was an activist and I was in situations very much like this. <laughs> I'll just uh, do a little bit of a uh, word over here. Uh, this is a police officer that thinks there is weapons and he is beginning to draw his own weapon. quite done that segment but I'm just going to interrupt for just a minute because I want to just comment what's happening here. Uh, there's a police officer who's about to pull his weapon. He's also got a guard dog. Uh, he's about to release that into the crowd. Uh, there was never any weapons found at the Elsie Book Took site. There was one uh, uh, hunting rifle that was in someone's trunk 
on that day. That's it. It was not at this gathering. Um, but what has happened? Our, our uncle, our relative, has offered to put his body on the line for his community. He said, I will sacrifice myself. And then, remarkably, like uh, every, son, every single person who's had a sister or an auntie uh, or a grandmother, uh, his partner, his auntie, whoever that might be, steps in front and says, no, hurt me. I will give myself up. So you see two instances of incredible sacrifice because a community believes so deeply in the protection of water and territory, their home, that they're willing to put their lives on the line. But then something incredible happens, something that still today uh, blows my mind and reminds me of how residential schools have failed, how every colonization policy has failed, how no matter how many uh, armed officers are sent to our communities, we have the most profound teachings that continue to maintain us as a people. And these aren't certainly my people, these are Mi'kmaq people, uh, but the resilience of indigeneity is uh, un unwavering. Here, right here. Watch our uncle, watch our brother, with the very police force that just a second ago had threatened his life. He offers his hand. And that, that is the truth. That is the truth right there of what I Don't Know More was about, what Oka was about, what Ipawash was about. It was about Indigenous peoples countless times offering a hand of friendship, offering a table for conversation, offering peace, love, and justice to a country that offers SWAT teams, machine guns, dogs. Here's the third segment. Uh, make sure I jump to the right way here. Uh, you pan across the crowd and you'll see something that I think is uh, never been really reported upon in mainstream media uh, except for indigenous reporters who constantly talk about it. And uh, take a look. We see a wave of police officers. We see people with social media, right, running the show. The entire reason we have this video is because of social media. And a woman smudging a guy with an AK-47 a guy with a machine gun right there. Uh, we see grannies confronting officers, armed officers, with songs and with dance. And why would a song, why would a dance, why would drums be offered? It's because you're being invited into a dance. You're being invited to join in. Just like how we offer food to those who come to our homes uh, to create relationships, the truth is found in that image. Uh, in our uncle and him standing up uh, in the reaction to uh, the police officers and the institutions. But then most importantly, like those are one group of fierce grannies there. And how many of those do we know? Like, how many of those do we know? We know endless amounts of fierce grandmothers who uh, work every day to make sure that we continue as a people. You know, uh, to talk a little bit about the truth means that we have to talk about how we feel. And we have to talk about what we see. And ultimately, we have to talk about our humanity. We have to talk about empathy. And we have to talk about what all this means to come from this incredible violent history, to inherit it together, and figure out a way to move forward. What I say to all the journalists in my newsroom is that uh, not one of the issues of poverty, uh, struggle, uh, the, the, the fact that this year in Winnipeg is, is uh, on record to be the most Indigenous homicides in any Canadian city in history. So we're on track to have the highest amount anytime, anywhere. In one year. That's just in one year. You might, add, you might say to yourself, well, uh, what about the Northwest Resistance? This is a, 
an example. But you could, t in, in any Canadian urban city in the modern period, we're on the record for the most of all time. You could write about that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, where does the change come in? Where does the opportunity and where does the hope enter in all of this? And it is by the mere f sake that, that you as a journalist, and this is what I say to be those in the newsroom, is that you get to be a part of telling that story. And that means that you have an opportunity. You don't just have an opportunity to talk about it, but you also have an opportunity to decide what we will talk about. What it is that we will emphasize. What I call the hanger on the story, which is your opening lead. And your ability to frame the story in such a way means that you will never be objective. You will always have a point of view and a perspective. And it, whatever you deem to be the facts will be the facts that you chose for that story and your editor chooses to include and not include. And that means that you have a role to play. That's what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, more than any other industry in the th second half of the, uh, of the TRC calls. So the TRC calls are split into two categories. There's the legacy section, which is child welfare, justice, health, language and culture, and education. Those are the institutions that have been most damaging for us as Indigenous peoples, and particularly for non-Indigenous peoples who have framed non-Indigenous peoples to feel superior, Indigenous peoples to feel inferior. Um, and so those are the institutions that are the most problematic. But then there's the second section. That's calls to action 43 through 94. Uh, those calls to action are about all the new things that we need to do. Things never been done before. Uh, those are the new institutions. Things like implementing the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. A, po a papal apology. And there are these three things. You know, journalism, uh, almost higher than any other industry, gets their own three calls. The first one is to uh, support the CBC, but particularly the northern CBC. Don't think it was like they chose the CBC as the only people to support. It was because the, in the north, the CBC is often the only media that's available, just infrastructure-wise. Then the support of APTN, the only uh, large-scale national indigenous broadcaster. I have always said that uh, if you want a real lesson in your life on media, watch half an hour of APTN National News, and on the same day, watch half an hour of The National. And what you'll realize is that the way the truth is framed by media is always a choice. Like, for example, what you'll notice on The National, it's almost always conflict, war, the same images we just saw in the first minute. The first, you know what the leading story on APTN National News usually is? Grandmother mentors grandson. That's like the leading story. That's like the top, today, uh, today in Pegwa's First Nation, someone learned to bead. <laughs> and that doesn't mean uh, that's not uh, as important as Ukraine. Because they tell Ukraine too. But it's usually story four or five. This is the key to think of truth as relational. Truth is about, not about just uh, what a fact is, but then how do we choose the fact? Because... A fact is a living entity. It's something that we decide to be. Uh, in fact, in, in, our, in our stories, and if I had more, more time, now, maybe if I could, maybe I will have time, I'm not sure. But uh, one of the things that we talk about is we talk about truth as being a living entity. It is something alive. It's not a thing. It's something that we share space with. Uh, Duncan talks a lot about that in Decolonizing Journalism, which I encourage you all to read and spend time. It uh, just came out this month. Uh, uh, he's a very good friend of mine. I think of him as a kind of a, someone I look up to, and I, you know, if, I, if I were to be anybody what I want to be when I grow up, it would be someone like Duncan McHugh. I don't think I'll ever get that tall, but, <laughs> but uh, Duncan is uh, not only just an incredible uh, Anishinaabe, but he's an incredible journalist, uh, human being, father, uh, just a, uh, and he's an amazing person and writer. Um, I get to have an opportunity to spend time with, with uh, Duncan and his new book, uh, and he's been for years telling reporters what they should be doing. Now, if you go through that reporter's checklist, which I did earlier today, every single one of you, by the way, should go through the reporter's checklist. Uh, they are not brain-numbing, impossible things to do. They're like, have you thought about how respectful you should be? Have you considered that an Indigenous voice should be in a story about Indigenous peoples? Should you have Indigenous voices in a story that is not an Indigenous issue? 
Like basic basic principles like that. What I would say is that have you thought of indigenous peoples like human beings? Are indigenous peoples human beings? You've all been conditioned, we've all been conditioned, me too, to consider indigenous peoples are not human beings. That's what the TRC said. The TRC said that we have been, uh, we've thought of indigenous peoples like livestock, dehumanized, don't matter, and particularly there are things like their silly claims for land don't matter. And so when in grade six, you get that little map activity from your teacher and they say draw Canada or color Canada, you colored the whole thing one color. If you colored it with indigenous nations, you'd run out of pencil crayons in about 10 minutes. Because there'd be 600, 700, 1,000, 2,000 different colors. And they would all be overlapping. It would be the most beautiful map you've ever seen. But we've been taught to see it in one color only. And so what Duncan's trying to get you to do there, as a journalist, is to say, raise your game to think of indigenous peoples like human beings. That's how straightforward it is. Think of those in Elsie Book took and how you would cover that story. Do we need to define it only by the first minute or by fierce grannies? You know, I come from a community that uh, has suffered incredibly, incredible from removal, ethnic cleansing. And I use ethnic cleansing intentionally. And I've been, uh, I want to tell you a story about how I've talked about my community because uh, when I talk about it, I call it a moment of ethnic cleansing in 19, sorry, yeah, 1907. We, we signed a treaty in 1817 with non-Indigenous peoples from the Hudson Bay Company, a guy called Lord Selkirk, to agree to share territory along the Red River. The way Lord Selkirk interpreted that treaty was that he gets all the land. That's a very uh, British way of approaching it. Uh, and then he also said, well, Indigenous peoples don't get anything anymore, except for the small little plot of land just north of where our, we want our land, which is what was eventually becoming the St. Peter's Indian Settlement, which is where I grew up, where my father grew up. Uh, it became a city because in 1907, the government of Canada, the town of Selkirk, forced us off the land by gunpoint. They came in one day, uh, passed a law in Ottawa, to ensure that we were treated as you know, lesser than human beings, moved off the land, and then forced to move to what's now Pegwis First Nation, lands that flood out every single year. In fact, this year, the most flooded time in history, the most worst flood of a century. And if you think to yourself, uh, wow, that's really terrible, look at all those terrible images, um, <clears throat> I would tell you that one of them is from last year. Because every year, it floods in Pegwis. There are 2,000 people sleeping in a hotel just this week from this flood. And there are uh, 92 people who from the 2017 flood and 42 people from the 2011 flood who are still in hotels. Imagine living in a hotel for 11 years of your life through a pandemic. And so telling this story is important. Of course we should. We should talk about that. We should also call it ethnic cleansing because then we would get to the truth of what ha actually happened, which is that people were impacted from my community way back in 1907. Uh, but when I use the term ethnic cleansing, the editor always removes it all the time because it hasn't been de deemed as ethnic cleansing, unless I write an opinion piece. Right? But we need to call things what they are, not because we're somehow ma making some major political fight or some kind of, uh, because that's what it is. If this, was, if this was in Palestine or if this was in the Middle East or Asia or Africa, we would have no problem calling it ethnic cleansing. But when it comes to indigenous people, suddenly we have to debate about it. The work that I do here uh, is talking about the, the, the truth. You know, um, I say to journalists that if you want to get to know indigenous people, if you want to get to know indigenous stories, you want to do a better job. You have to spend time with Indigenous peoples, and it can't be on the clock. And so uh, we have an opportunity here. I, I, I volunteer with the Mama Bear Clan. My Mama Bear Clan is a street patrol uh, that's run through the North Point Douglas Women's Center. Um, it's part of the video that you saw there. You know that I started covering the, the Mama Bear Clan, and then eventually I just realized I got to walk with them. I got to start doing the work because uh, it wasn't just enough to cover people. It was that the fact that uh, as I was watching those in that video, in that moment with the film crew who said, uh, go out there and cover an indigenous story. And I realized that they, are, they, were, they were there saving lives. And what was I doing? What was I doing in that moment? What was I doing by being a spectator with the film crew, literally watching someone else 
save the life of people who look like me. In the standing on the very spot, on the very street corner that my grandfather used to sleep when he'd pass out after being sexually, physically abused in a residential school and uh, becoming an alcoholic. Yeah, and there was this epiphanic moment where I said, this is what I have to do. Because I can't just talk about these issues, I've got to live these issues. It's about how we live our lives. And that's what the truth is about. The truth is not just about what we say, but it's what we do. So I say to reporters, is come for a walk with us. And don't feel that it's for a story. Go and live in your community, get to know the people in your community, and do the work necessary to help your community. And in Manitoba, this is like, it's impossible not to. You know, the census numbers just came out for 2021. It showed that Indigenous peoples are growing 10% every five years, which is different than 2016, which was 10 years, uh, it's 2006, 2016, which, which showed a 42.5% growth. There's something interesting that happened in those 10 years, which I think talk a little bit about Indigenous identity. I think more people are self-identifying as Métis, good, bad, great, ugly. You can see the exponential number of Métis people which are growing. Uh, but, that, but the number in 2021 is evidence that Indigenous communities are growing, 10%. And they are growing exponentially high in, in, in centres like Winnipeg, Saskatoon, Regina, and Thunder Bay the most. We're now 16% of Winnipeg, 20% of Manitoba. As you go every 100 kilometers north of Winnipeg, you get up another 3, 4, 5% till you reach Churchill and Thompson. We're talking 30, 40, 50% in some towns. My town uh, had an exponentially high Indigenous population, even though we had been removed from the territory. So what happened in growing up is I had this abnormal experience in Canada as having been normalized Indigenous peoples in the mainstream, in middle class. We had a mayor who was Indigenous. So when I came to other communities where that doesn't happen, it struck me as the moment in which I think Canada is not realizing the reality of the, what's happening on the ground in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Northwestern Ontario, which is that you see 10% growth every single year, and you also see that Indigenous peoples are exponentially younger. The biggest group of Indigenous peoples are between the age of 5 and 19. That's the, that's the biggest wave, which is my daughter's age. My wave, which is from the 70s to 80s, uh, are between the ages of 30 and 44, 59 in that neighborhood. I'm 46, so kind of on the top end of that part. Um, my point of saying it is, is that there's more of me coming. There's more of me coming, and most of us are going to be coming from the prairies. We're going to be coming from Manitoba, Saskatchewan, northwestern Ontario. But Toronto, Ottawa, Vancouver, you're coming. You're next. Because you have exponentially grow, growing populations too. And it'll be slower. It'll be much slower. And that tells you a central truth here, which is that uh, in Manitoba, it is an uh, employable skill. It is the most important employable skill for media to be able to work effectively with Indigenous communities. And that means you've got to live with Indigenous communities. You can't just report on them. You've got to actually go out there. You've got to do the work. That's how you're going to find the truth. It's through relationship. It's not going to be by parachuting in. Because you know what happens when you parachute in? Uh, when McLean sends a reporter to Winnipeg for a coffee break, and they report that Winnipeg is the most racist city in the galaxy, that does nothing to forward any conversations. That's the one minute that I just spoke about a minute ago. I'm more, far more interested in the fierce grannies, which, by the way, are the Mama Bear clan, led by grandmothers. That's where the truth is found. And I know Toronto, Ottawa, Vancouver, Montreal, I know you all like to think you're leading, that you're the head of these things. I would say that Manitoba might just be a place you can learn a lot from. Saskatchewan, Thunder Bay, Regina, Saskatoon, Winnipeg. These are places that you can learn a lot from. And they might be the place where the truth might be more evident. It might be on the front cover of a newspaper every day, 20% of it. Not chosen consciously, not even a policy. It's just responsible journalism. It's the truth. So with that, I say a big miigwech and thank you for your time. And I really appreciate being uh, invited to this uh, fantastic gathering. And uh, I would ha be happy to do a conversation or so. Um, I can tell you my funny story about my hot mics at APTN that one time. Why the Atlio family still doesn't talk to me. Uh, this is broadcast, so I'm probably going to get in trouble if I tell that story. So. But yeah, OK, thanks, everybody. Yeah. Yeah.
questions. Yep. Questions or com I actually like comments better because don't feel that yeah like it's like the, the it is the least indigenous thing to do to th expect one person to be the only answer giver. So uh, your point is part of uh, the important contribution of what tonight is. So comment is this is good. Yeah, quick. Uh, Professor Sinclair, can you tell us about the hot mic story? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, never call me professor again, or you'll be sent to your room. All right. Uh, so, okay, so it's my first real big panel on APTN. It's, I've just transitioned from, I haven't quite started the free press yet, but I'm doing a lot of media. And I've got a, uh, myself and another person who, uh, that person can out themselves if they want as part of this story. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what happened is, is that the way APTN did its year-end show, uh, which is a basically one-hour conversation on the top stories over the year, is... Uh, uh, is that they uh, they basically have five segments, four segments or something, and then they do do a segment on a topic, uh, sort of top five things, so five segments, and then there'd be a commercial, and they go to the next segment. Anyways, so I had no idea that they were broadcasting this online. And so they uh, they broadcast this online. It was on TV, but it was, was live, and I, I thought they turned the mics off during the commercial breaks. So four out of the five commercial breaks was fine. But one out of the commercial breaks, I started making jokes about how short Sean Atlio is. Because <laughs> have, you, have you seen the guy? He's really short. And the fact that that he were, you know, at the time there was a lot of criticism happening you know, of the AFN and Atlio's. Anyways, it was not my own shining moment. But I can tell you how I found out was I checked my phone. My phone just starts ringing like crazy. <laughs> And, I, and I'm on the commercial and I check my phone and uh, it's in capital letters and it's from my friend in Portland, Oregon, who's watching <laughs> online. And the capital letters are, your mic is hot. <laughs> now, that's not even the end of the story. You want to hear the end of the story? Yeah. That was December 24th. We did the year-end show. It was one of those weird years where the next day was, uh, actually it was 23rd, sorry, it's 23rd. And then the next day, APTN was closed. So <clears throat> that gets uploaded, and the whole place is a ghost town. Like, it's just basically, they record it, it goes online. I said to the guy, can you make sure to edit the commercials out, or at least when you do the broadcast? He's like, oh, no problem. So anyways, I go on that night, a couple hours later, it's still on there. Like, the jokes are still there. <laughs> and I phone, and by this point, nobody's picking up at EPTN. It's locked tight, and it's now a little thing on the website that says, our office will be reopened on January 2nd. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I wasn't the only person making jokes. <laughs> right? So anyways, so I had to call the CEO of, of APTN and say, I'm really sorry. Can you, get, can you send somebody down there to fix at least that segment, okay? <laughs> Because I didn't mean for that mic to be hot, and it, it, it teaches you a big lesson about being in media. And that was my very hard crash course in media. So, yes? Um, first of all, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, many of us who are immigrant journalists come from formerly colonized backgrounds ourselves, but we are settlers nonetheless. Um, how do we go about examining our relationship with indigenous communities as journalists uh, and as newcomers? Yeah. So, I think. Uh, you know, I, I'm. You may notice that I'm very biased for the prairies of where I come from, and I think it's just because I grew up in such a different circumstance than the rest of the country. The only thing close I would say is, you know, my experience in Vancouver, in segments, pockets of Vancouver, pockets of on the west coast. But you know, uh, we have a indigenous credit requirement at the University of Manitoba. That means that every single student uh, taking an arts degree, which is about a third of the students or a quarter of the students, uh, that means we're talking thousands of students, have to take three credit hours in Indigenous Studies. Uh, and so at the University of Winnipeg, it's mandatory across the board. So what I'm trying to say is that if you come to Winnipeg, uh, you're a new immigrant, guess what? Uh, you didn't know Indigenous peoples existed till about 10 minutes ago. Now you're off the plane. You're walking in the community. You realize indigenous peoples exist. That's, by the way, one of the reasons that when we when Syrians were brought to Winnipeg, we drummed them in as activists. We we made sure that they understood that they're treaty people too, and they're home. They're not they're not foreigners. They are our relatives, and we love you. That's why we want you here. So, uh, 
but it is very difficult, I think, for many indigenous, uh, not uh, sorry, immigrant people, to understand the experience of indigenous peoples. But you know, colonization is remarkably similar across the board globally. So I think there's lots of empathy there. But I think there is oftentimes uh, a, a narrative that immigrants are are uh, immersed into, you know, sort of dumped into, which is that if you just work hard enough, you can you can somehow make it. There's no working hard enough on a reserve. Like, there, you know, people always say, pick up your bootstraps. There's no boots to pull up on the reserve unless your auntie made them for you. And there's definitely no place to go buy the boots because the Indian Act prohibits your economic ability. So there is a severe issues that I think immigrants are not given. And that's why in that video, um, we have to participate more actively with the immigrant community. Uh, I go to prayers on Friday at the mosque. And that's not just me. Um, that's not just me building relationship. I, I genuinely care a lot about the uh, Islamic community. I've been adopted by an Islamic family in, in town because I care very deeply about our relationship with the Islamic community. And so I do a lot of work in that area. Um, but at the same time, I also think it's tough for immigrants. We should be sensitive. But I also think that immigrants need to be aware that they're being sold a narrative about Canada before they arrive and from the moment that they are immersed into this nationalistic narrative. And it is not the same to be an immigrant or an Indigenous person. And so it's not appropriate to impose a narrative on Indigenous peoples uh, that may that you may think is the Canadian story because the most Canadian story is that Indigenous peoples have been set up to fail and they've been hammered into poverty and then forced to stay there. And when you get uh, emergences, uh, it's because of the tremendous amount of Indigenous creativity that to move around or under or over colonization. Like every, every Indigenous person that stands in front of you who has a degree or has a college or a business or, um, you know, is able to uh, do uh, whatever that they're able to do in their effective way or their, in their lives is a miracle. The fact that we come out uh, with our teachings intact, with our language intact, with our cultures and our sense of identity still intact, even though we may experience trauma, we are miracles. We are all miracles because of the uh, tremendous assault that this country has taken upon us. So I think immigrants should be uh, supported more. And I feel bad for those students who are dumped into my intro class and didn't know Indigenous peoples existed other than, uh, you know, the occasional cowboy western movie they saw maybe on the other side. I, I gave a talk in Colombo, Sri Lanka. And uh, it was, I, there is tremendous curiosity. Uh, I was, gave a talk in Colombo, Sri Lanka, and what they did was, is they didn't even put my name on the poster. They said, a Native American Indian is coming to speak here. And they were like, Negon Sinclair font four, you know? <laughs> and, and when I came there, the crowd, it was packed, like 300 people. But well, I quickly realized that they didn't expect me to be wearing, like, a suit. They wanted me to be wearing something else. And, and so th I think there is a kind of a, a way in which uh, immigrants have been for framed to see Indigenous peoples just as Canadians have. So, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I have another question, not a comment. Yeah. Um, you <laughs> but your comment is, OK. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's amazing how people that I uh, like when I was when I was on the streets and I was doing the, organizing marches. Um, there was this tight knit community that are all professionals now. One of it, one is an MP, one is a chief, a grand chief of an organization. It's amazing. We've all gone on to different things in the professional world, and so we're we're buddies, right? Like we literally went through the trenches together for you know three four years, and then you know now doing in different segments of our life. But how many of my friends who I've gone through such <laughs> crazy times with, uh, they always start every conversation with, "This is not on the record." <laughs> And I'm like, I wasn't doing a story generally. <laughs> like, it's amazing how many of my friends think I'm always like, I'm looking for to expose them or something. I don't know. Like, maybe that, I don't know if that talks about me. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I tell you that, it, it, like, and, and I've also screwed up too, you know, like, and I've also, uh, I've made mistakes as, as a journalist too. Um, you know, one time I, uh, I was given an off the record photo 
and I sent it to the paper, they published it. And it should have been, I shouldn't have done that, right? I didn't, it was a mistake. And so uh, the most important thing is always humility. And the way that I think of this is, uh, um, I'll tell you a story about how I, uh, how I kind of operate in terms of my academics. So, you know, when I got a PhD, I really thought I was like hot stuff, you know, like I was like, Miss Dr. Sinclair. Right here. Professor, I don't know what the heck that's about, but anyways, Dr. Sinclair. So, so I go to my auntie's house, and I say, hey, auntie, look, I'm Dr. Sinclair, and I hold up my PhD. I'm like, ah, and she's like, she smiles, and she goes to the cupboard, and she grabs an axe, and she says, congratulations, Dr. Sinclair, now go chop me some wood. <laughs> so then I'm in the backyard chopping wood, right, and she opens the door. She's like, how's that dissertation coming? Okay, and I, like... Uh, my point is, is that uh, humility will carry you many places in Indigenous communities, but actually only so far. You have to do the you have to do the dishes, you have to chop the wood, you have to offer to clean up after yourself. Like nobody wants a freeloader. Nobody wants somebody who's going to parachute into a community and absolutely misrepresent it. That's why you have to live it. Or as one of my elders says, is I can tell you about the song all day, but eventually you got to sing it. I'm, I'm singing you the song so that you can learn it. Not so that you can sing it today. In fact, you're going to have to earn that. You're going to have to or hear it 50, 100, 300 times. But eventually I'm going to turn the drum to you and say, you got to sing it now. And that's what we want reporters to do. We don't want them to come in and say, oh, now I can sing the song. I heard it once. We want them to build a relationship with us to tell the story that is about ultimately about humanity, injustice, but also creativity, hope. Like I never once in my entire life, even in the most direst of circumstances, um, I was there during the entire trial which saw uh, the likely murderer of, uh, um, alleged murderer, sorry, the likely alleged murderer of, <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's a funny word right there, uh, but uh, get off on the murder of Tina Fontaine. And I, I was with the family I saw everything that took place, and at the end, uh, the auntie still wanted to tell everybody how much she loves them, and how, how much Tina was honored by everybody coming out, and how much it's an evidence of a life that's lost, but was for a purpose, and it was to bring us all together. So that's the story. That's the story of beauty. But it's also the real truth. That's the real truth of that happened with, with what happened in that time. And it is a, a travesty that we will probably never... Uh, there will be no justice for that, for that young person. But it will also be uh, with tremendous creativity and hope that Indigenous peoples continue just as a miracle, as a, as a miracle every day. Right? Yeah? Sorry, I have another question. No, you must give a statement. <laughs> and it must be in well, 40 I words. Guess, I guess the statement is I really, really appreciate what you said about truth coming from feeling and from the heart. I think that resonates with me. It's living, yeah. It's, yeah. it's something that's created in a moment. You know. Absolutely, yeah. And I guess my question stems from that, is that as reporters, at least as a journalism student right now, I feel very much like I'm under the purview and, you know, my final authority is my editor, and that limits almost what actually goes out into the world. So my truth that I've written down is getting filtered and filtered and filtered before it gets out to the world. So I guess... How do editors become a part of the change that you're talking about? And how do reporters navigate it when editors say no? Yeah, well, my... Sorry, my, I can't take off my literary studies hat here. And I would say that no story is a single authored story anyways. So when you tell a story, you're telling the story of many. And so therefore, when you hand the story off to an editor, it will then go through many other hands. And I think that's good. I think that's what stories are supposed to do. And they're supposed to go through many hands. And But at the same time, you know, I, uh, I, have, I work with people at the Winnipeg Free Press that I really dislike politically and I really disagree with and I hate how they edit my stories. So there's two approaches to that as a journalist. You can talk to that person uh, kindly and try to engage that in a conversation around education and say this is why I write this, this is why this fact was important, this is why this part of the story was important. Or you can go to your editor and just scream and kick and make sure that person doesn't touch your pieces again. But then what have you created at the end, right? You've created a whole bunch of acrimony and that person's not leaving the newsroom, 
right? Unless they do something egregious. So I wear on the side of relationship. That's what I believe to the nth degree, and I've never steered me wrong. Uh, I have, however, made many mistakes and trusted the wrong people once in a while, but that's the risk and the atrocity of love. The, the, atro the audacity of believing in the kindness and the goodness of people is that they sometimes fail you. So what I would say is that uh, the, the editors need as much education for a call to action 57 there, or no, what was it? Uh, this one right here. They, sorry, 84. 57 is the papal one, isn't it? It doesn't matter. I'm getting them all messed up. So, um, Call to action 84, which, uh, 86, sorry, 86 talks about the fact that everybody in the newsroom needs to be cognizant and trained appropriately. But I actually don't think training and cultural awareness ever does much. Here's what they do is they teach people catchphrases and ornamental language. It's the living work that is where change comes from. It's the relational work. So uh, what I, when my editor asked me to come in uh, to come and train the staff, I say, does it have to be in the newsroom? Like, can we all just go somewhere then? All right, and then, and then we get into cost or whatever. <laughs> and then, but I'd say, you know, editors are people. They got a job to do. And also, uh, I, every time I complain about an editor, I think about the fact when I hand it in two minutes before deadline. So maybe I'm being too generous. I don't know. Uh, but I also know that probably an editor would eventually see this on YouTube <laughs> and know that I don't hate you. I just, uh, I, I don't really like, I, like I, I really dislike, so I'll give you a story of what just happened. Yeah, so I wrote a piece about uh, the, um, um, I'm not sure what you'd call it, but the identity of Mary Ellen Trapel is what, uh, so the, the, the complicated uh, identity that her, she has woven in the past and presently. So I wrote a piece about that. Um, I, I filed it on Friday. They edited it. And then they decided at 4 o'clock that the paper was too heavy. They would put it in Monday's paper. Now, Mary Ellen Drapel releases a statement Friday at about 6 p.m. Uh, that statement has to go in my story. Like, I can't, like, it makes me look stupid if I don't have it in the story for Monday. So they say to me, okay, you've got, you've, you've got 24 hours or so to file it. I work on it, work on it, work on it. I finally file it Sunday morning. Well, turns out that we only have a part-time editor on Sunday morning. This person never gets to my story. They publish my story on Monday from the Friday edit version. So I can be mad about that, and I was mad about it, but I can also be aware that we are a struggling newsroom in the most competitive industry, newspapers, and we're also in a, in a way in which uh, that editor maybe just didn't, you know, he's overworked. So I just deal with the reality and I accept it. And Part of being a part of the only last or the one of the very final remaining independent newspapers in the country is that we all got to give a little. We all got to be understanding, and uh, we're not going to get it perfect. Uh, but maybe the imp maybe the imperfection is the perfection. Yeah. Oh, you win! You win! Way to go! Gold star for you. Yeah, I can't tell, well, I'll tell two stories and then I'll finish off here. Uh, because I actually think that's a good exercise to sort of figure out, like, what are the stories most often told. Um, the story that I, I often see is 
it'll be a reporter doing a voiceover, and they'll be like, indigenous peoples want their injustices recognized and the genocide finally affirmed, and they'll show people round dancing. And I'll just be like, you know what indigenous peoples actually want you to see is how we are committed to this country far more than Canadians. Like, and yes, we want our genocide affirmed, but as in a relational process, so that you know we're understanding that we are all in this together. So, like newspapers mo or journalists, most oftentimes want to tell this very black and white story about conflict, but then Indigenous peoples just subvert that narrative <laughs> because it's just not, that's not the narrative we're talking about. We're talking about round dancing in a mall, not because we hate y'all, but because we actually love y'all, and that we're gonna we want this country to be better. We want it to be inclusive and actually just and follow its own laws, which is supposedly recognizing Indigenous and treaty rights, in theory. Uh, okay, second story. The story that's most often told that I have been very proud, it still comes up once in a while in the free press, but I really work really hard to challenge our journalists to not tell that story. It is this story. It's the famous, and I call it the Jordan Tutu story, because I really started to notice it when Jordan Tutu made the NHL. Um, <clears throat> Indigenous person comes from nothing and becomes something. <laughs> that is the Jordan Tutu everlasting frame, and with apologies to Jordan Tutu, journalism failed you because you didn't come from nothing. Like, what is nothing? Family, community, language, land. Like, there's nothing, there's nothing about that that is nothing. In fact, that's everything. I would, I would say that the entire reason that he was able to make the NHL is because he had a loving family. He had a kind uh, grandmother that cared for him. He had a beautiful land that he came from. He had the most remarkable teachings, which is the reason he made the NHL. I'd say far more than the ability to pass a puck. That's what led you to success. And so the way that journalists frame this suddenly, and guess what something is, by the way? Capitalism, success in urban markets, and then, you know, making a million bucks. That's not success, by the way, in an indigenous world. I mean, I'd like a million bucks, don't get me wrong. But you know what we would do with a million bucks? First person is, you come up to you as your family, be like, okay, all right, <laughs> share it. <laughs> You're like, when we bag a moose, when we come back to the community, you, the, if you hoarded the moose, everybody would hate you. You have to share the moose. Because that's what our teachings tell us, is that, is that your, the, your richness is found in your relationships with others. And so your job is to share. And I think that, uh, you know, the story of that nothing to something is a story that's, insert whichever indigenous person you want, it's, they've most often been framed in that way. My father, I saw that growing up. My father, you know, went, they framed him as, oh, he came from nothing, he overcame obstacles from the nothing, and then became something. Look at him now, he's a judge. I'm like, do you all realize that he's only there because of my mom? Right, or, or me? <laughs> or, or, you know, or our, our whole, uh, you know, our, our community, our language, our, et cetera, et cetera. That's my thing. All right, miigwech. Thanks so much, everybody. Really appreciate all that. So. A wonderful, wonderful talk. It was as amazing as I thought it would be, <laughs> and as I promised at the beginning of this. Um, so that's it for tonight. We're going to be back in uh, the room across the hall tomorrow uh, at 9 a.m. and back on live stream and on Zoom. Um, for anybody who is here, I'm sorry, everybody online, there is some food and coffee uh, that you can all please take advantage of. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much, and thank you again, Megan. It was incredible, and I uh, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thank you.